Hi, I'm Heather Marie Montilla, and you're watching PBS Books. Thank you for joining us today. PBS Books, in collaboration with the Association for the Study of African American Life and History, is pleased to host a conversation with award winning Honore Fannin Jeffers, author of The Love Songs of W.E.B. Du Bois, in connection with the Henry Louis Gates latest documentary, Making Black America Through the Grapevine. It is a four part series that explores Black Americans' centuries long history of establishing communities and attaining social, political, and economic success in the face of racial segregation. It premieres on PBS stations across the country starting on October 4th. Making Black America takes viewers into an extraordinary world that showcases Black people's ability to collectively prosper, defy white supremacy, and define Blackness in ways that transformed America itself. Let's take a moment to watch a trailer. Watching the game of bid whistles like going to the Apollo on <laughs> amateur, amateur night. night. <laughs> there is a magic to this game that makes it the Black national pastime. Oh. Where'd that queen come from? I think they cheat. <laughs> Throughout our history, Black Americans have, with great ingenuity and imagination, created a world with its own values and rules. A world defined by unfettered racial self-expression. A world behind what W.E.B. Du Bois called the veil. When we talk about networks of Black people, we're talking about different types of associations. There's a social type, fraternal and intellectual organizations. How were each of you shaped by black social institutions? I grew up in African preschool. I didn't learn Snow White in the Seven Dwarfs. I learned Cold Black in the Seven Simbas. <laughs> <laughs> what does black joy mean to you? Black joy means being in a safe space and feeling free, where you can really be yourself and shed that skin. Wherever you have a large concentration of African-Americans, you have business districts that rise up, that meet the needs in these communities. Annie Malone and Madam C.J. Walker basically developed hair straightening. Was that a good thing for black beauty? Part of our magic is that we can do anything with our hair. I can straighten it. I'm still going to be dope Julie, black Julie. Black social networks, black institutions, they are like barrier islands. They protect us from the storms of this country. When we come together, what time is it? So what happens when we begin to see the deterioration of black institutional life? There have been people who've argued that our community was better off before integration. When I was growing up, everybody in my sphere was black. There was just that sense of everybody in this together. I think we've lost that. When we look now in the 21st century, we see many of the same issues our black foremothers and forefathers faced, economic disenfranchisement, anti-black violence. No no but we're facing them without many of the institutions that black people had to sustain them during the first round. I constantly am thinking about what it means to occupy my identities. I do surround myself with blackness. As long as race counts in America, black networks and institutions will always matter. From the founding of the Prince Hall Masons to black Twitter, African Americans have forged networks in their own image as the ultimate act of resistance and survival. Just a reminder that Making Black America Through the Grapevine airs on Tuesdays in October at 9 p.m. Eastern Standard. Check your local listing so you don't miss it. Well, today's conversation, we are here to speak with Honore Fannin Jeffers, who is the author of Love Songs of W.E.B. Du Bois. 
Anna Ray Fanning Jeffers is a fiction writer, poet, and essayist. She is an author of five poetry collections, including the 2020 collection, The Age of Phyllis, which won the NAACP Image Award for Outstanding Literary Work in Poetry and the Lenore Marshall Poetry Prize. She was a contributor to the, the Fire This Time, A New Generation Speaks About Race, edited by Jasmine Ward, and has been published in the Kenyan Review, Iowa Review, and other literary publications. She was elected to the American Antiquarian Society, whose members include 14 U.S. presidents and is critic at large for the Kenyan Review. She is a professor of English and the Paul and Carol Dobbs Sutton Chair at the University of Oklahoma. The Love Songs of W.E.B. Du Bois is her first novel and was a New York Times bestseller, winner of the National Book Critic Circle Award for Fiction, long listed for the National Book Award, short listed for the Center for Fiction First Novel Prize, a finalist for the Kirkus Prize for Fiction, long listed for the Aspen Words Literary Prize and an Oprah Book Club pick. It is my honor to welcome Professor Honoré. Hi, how are you? I am so glad to have you. Now, before we get started, there's one thing I always like to thank my library partners out there, 1800 Strong, for joining yes. us. Um, we are always so happy to have all of them out there, as well as local PBS stations. And we also like to thank our viewers. But uh, Professor Honoré, we are so happy to have you and to get to speak about the love songs of W.E.B. Du Bois. And I thought that we could start with you sharing just a brief summary about the premise of your book. Well, the book is about um, both um, an American and African-American family um, in the deep South in Georgia and their trials and their joys throughout the centuries as well as a story about America writ large and its founding and how um, African-Americans are um, woven throughout the fabric of American society. So you've worked on this book for quite a while, I think about a decade. What inspired you to finally have it published now and what inspired you to start to write? Well, I'll start um, with the second question first. Uh, I, I've, um, I was an early reader. My um, recently late sister, Valjean, taught me how to read um, when I was about four and a half or five. So um, I uh, quickly uh, 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 reached about the college level I think uh, uh, in reading when I was about eight or nine. And so I would write little stories and things like that. And, um, and kind of kept that in my secret heart for a long time um, until my twenties, when I decided that I would step out on faith and be a writer. Um, so um, that's, that's how I started writing and what inspired me to um write the book, uh, I, I just couldn't stop. I, I, I really was nervous about being a poet. I started as a poet and I was really nervous about moving from poetry to fiction because sometimes there's a little gatekeeping between the genres, but the story just wouldn't let me go. And um, and originally, I've spoken about this before, it, originally it was a beach read. It was supposed to be a beach read. And then it turned into something more serious. Um, and then mm, mm, I think uh, about 10 years, I, I finished it. And then it was sold to um, Harper Books. And, um, and so there we are. Well, congratulations. I mean, it's Thank received you. so many acclaims. I, I, um, 
you know, when you look up even on Amazon or even at your library and you go to figure out, well, what is this book about? Right. Because I, as, as you know, I was familiar with you from, from your, your poetry, um, the age of Phyllis that we'll get to talk to you and talk about later. But one of the most amazing things is you've received so many accolades and this is a debut novel and it's just been incredible the reception that you've received. And I, and I think it deals with that you've, Yes, it is not a short read, but it is worth the read. <laughs> no, it's not a short read. <laughs> but it is worth the read. I, I and call you myself the Negro Tolstoy. <laughs> <laughs> well, you, you're you able, though, to incorporate so much historical information while it's fiction. And I think some of that I'm always so interested about. But before we get into like the nitty gritty, the details, I thought we could talk a little bit protagonist, right? Mm -hmm. The novel's protagonist is Ailey Pearl Garfield. The book discusses the name, but how did you choose this name? Well, there's a backstory that ended up on the cutting floor when we were in the editing process. Ailey's parents um, already had two children. And um, they sort of, uh, we call it had to get married, you know, back in the day, uh, her parents were uh, pregnant and then they got married. And so they never had a honeymoon. So when um, the first child, Lydia, was around six or seven, her parents decided to take a vacation and go to New York and see the Alvin Ailey Theater and um, the Alvin Ailey Dance Theater. And while there on a whim, they decided they were gonna have another baby. Aww. And so that's that's where a Ailey is named after the great Alvin Ailey because um, you know, they got caught up in the romance <laughs> after seeing Revelations. Well, so. <laughs> I love Alvin Ailey. And in fact, for those That's people, right. out, <laughs> so I figured. So for <laughs> those people who didn't know or don't know yet who Alvin Ailey is, we actually have a clip for all of you to be introduced. I'm Alvin Ailey. I'm a choreographer. I create movement and I'm searching for truth in movement. I have these creative fires bubbling inside. He was possessed. Some say the Alvin Ailey American Dance Theater is the most innovative dance company in the world. Sometimes your name becomes bigger than yourself. Alvin Ailey. Do you really know who that is or what it is? You see a name, but I don't see a man. Everybody used him as, see, this is the progress we're making. The problem is that if you're a black anything in this country, people want to put you into a bag. Our protest was on the stage. Choreography was his catharsis. We are his breath out. Do you feel as though you had to sacrifice anything to stay in dance? Everything. That is such an incredible trailer. And for those people out there who want <laughs> I know I get shivers like I love Revelation and even just I love that they have that at the end of the trailer. So for those people out there who don't know who Ailey is, please go to the PBS app and and watch American Masters. Um, but we are we are here talking about a fabulous, fabulous book by Professor Honoré. And um, there is a quote in that trailer, actually, that said, you know, Ailey's protest was on the stage. And I kind of, when when I heard that, I was like, is Professor Honoré's protest in her book? Yes, it is. I would say it's protest literature. It's it's a lot of things. And I mm -hmm. and and people um when they ask me about the book, or sometimes I'll, you know, sneak on Goodreads and someone will say, there's just so much in the book, but I didn't do it on purpose. It's just, um, if I may, African-American life is so rich. And um, we've been in this country um, really before the 1600s, but in terms of um, when the British uh, were here, 
uh, we've been in this country since the 17th century. Um, and so there's so much education, um, food ways, um, family strife, um, romance, you know, uh, uh, slavery, all of that is, is um, the civil rights movement. So there's so much to cover. And so um, uh, I, I do think the book is, is protest uh, and, and, and subtle protest because uh, a lot of people feel like um, black people are on the margins of America. And so what I wanted people to understand is now we are here. We have been here since the very beginning. And, um, and so there you have it. <laughs> so Ellie wants to be a historian, right? Mm -hmm. And we, you know, we're, we're watching Ellie and her discovery, but her grandmother wants her to be a doctor, right? And mm -hmm. Mike, I, I was wondering, is her this- paternal a grandmother. Yes. 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 Is yeah. this something you personally experienced or ha have observed or how did you come up with? Because I, I often feel like there there are conflicts of, of like that. But mm -hmm. I, I was curious, like, why you made that decision? And, um, you know, is that something you experienced? Did other people want you work? In, you're a professor of English. Mm -hmm. is everyone Was everyone in your family like, go for it? Or did people say? <laughs> well, um. In, in a lot of um, uh, African-American families, um, not just people who are from uh, the Deep South, but people whose parents are um, from uh, immediately from the continent of Africa, they've immigrated over here, or people are from the Caribbean, um, things like the humanities, things like the social sciences, you know, history is not, view, that's not viewed as a serious uh, profession. They want their, their kids to go into the STEM fields. And so that was sort of a gesture to that. But in terms of my own actual family, not Ailey's family, my father's grandfather was a doctor. His black grandfather was a doctor. His black great grandfather was a doctor. And then his white second great grandfather was a doctor. So um, medicine was actually a revered uh, profession. My, my father's grandfather, George Flippin, was the first black um, football player at the University of Nebraska. And his father, um, Charles uh, Flippin, was the first person to file a civil rights suit in the state of Nebraska. So uh, it's not an autobiographical book in the least, but there are these sort of small gestures towards my own history. Thank you for sharing that. Um, the story is centered in a fictional town in Georgia where her family had been enslaved um, up until the American Civil War. Why did you decide on a fictional town rather than an actual town? Well, when you start talking about a real town and you get something wrong, everybody gets mad. So um, a lot of people, for example, are, are, you know, they're like the city, which is never named that Ailey grows up in. They're like, it must be D.C. But I don't know D.C. I only know a little bit about D.C. I lived um, in Silver Spring, Maryland when I was a little bitty girl. When my father was teaching at Bowie State. And so I didn't want to get in trouble. And um, my mother's people are from Eatonton, Georgia, which is where uh, the novelist Alice Walker is from. My mother taught Miss Alice uh, when Miss Alice was in junior high school. But again, I only know Eatonton as a little girl. I don't know those sort of uh, particularities that people who grew up in Eatonton know. So that's why I came up with Chickasetta, but it's in the real Putnam County. Um, so that, that's how that happened. And education, I mean, you just gave tidbits of education. Education seems to play a central role in this conversation in your novel. Um, the Red Mound Church and the school having 59 students in two rooms, 
-hmm. Is that just for the audience? Is that was that typical in the South at that time? Mm -hmm. Yes, it was. And um, my mother um, went to uh, a, a one room schoolhouse. Uh, Flat Rock School when she was a little girl. And education is also very important because uh, there were laws against uh, Black literacy, uh, you know, before uh, the Civil War. And then there were still things that were done to discourage Black Civil War afterwards. And so, um, you know, I think it was the great um, Frederick Douglass that said, you know, once you learn to read, you will forever be free. And so that's why education is so important in the book. Yes, and that is a great quote. <laughs> um, the Moss Road Plantation. Um, mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> can you share what it is and about Ailey's experience? Wow, you really went deep into this book. Um, well, there, there, these plantations throughout the South are very uh, emotionally and historically contested spaces. For um, many white folks who will go to visit, they have these sort of um, romances um, about these plantations, you know, there are white people who've gotten married there and all of that. But to many African-Americans, these plantations are concentration camps. They view them as concentration camps. I visited um, several of these um, plantations throughout the years. And then also, if you go down south, um, there are a lot of bed and breakfasts in the town propers, and they'll they'll be former uh, homes that were formerly owned by um, people who owned slaves, and so there's 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 all of this pain that sort of seeps up from the ground, and so when Ailey and Dr. Oludara go. There is a message, there's a lesson that Dr. Oludara is trying to teach her about history not being simply in the pages of a book, but that the land is a historical text. And so Moss Road is a text, even though it, it's, it's a, you know, a, a home. I couldn't help but think when I when I was reading it about um, la a few weeks ago, we interviewed uh, Clint Smith and his journey, right, about um, That's visiting. A book. It's a great book. It is a great book. And for people to also, you know, uh, think about or watch that interview and, and learn a little bit more about Clint's perspective as he visited various places throughout the United States, various plantations. We, when Clint was on, we also talked about the Whitney plantation, which yes. obviously uh, presents facts in, in a very different way than you just described. And to, for those viewers out there who are not familiar, please look up the Whitney Plantation to, to learn about different perspectives and, and for sure um, about the work they do there, which is very important. Um, okay, so uh, one of the things, uh, you know that I love Phil Phyllis Wheatley, uh, but I was also attracted to your this book because of, I feel that W.E.B. Du Bois is such an important, important. Mm -hmm. he, he's just so important. Like I, he's such a great scholar and his writing is, is so inspirational. I love your archival notes, which to me, um, you know, after you read an 800 and something page book, you might not make it to the archival notes, but please everyone do because <laughs> it is like, it's like a, a like a love letter to W.E.B. kind of in, in a way. Um, and, and I feel as though um, it, it's, the book plays such tribute. But my question is, how did you, when you, you know, you decided to intersperse quotes by him, mm -hmm. you know, was that an idea from the beginning? Did you know you were gonna name this book Love Songs to W.E.B. Du Bois? Or how did you, how did that come about? Well, what's funny is I had a friend who um, 
read some of the, you know, first pages years ago. And he told me um, that it was a really pretentious title. <laughs> he, said, he said, this is a really pretentious title. And nobody, you know, uh, not a lot of people know who W.B. Du Bois is. Um, but as someone who went to a historically, who graduated from a historically Black college, um, Talladega College, my mother and my two late sisters uh, went to, attended Spelman College. My father taught at um, several HBCUs, including Morehouse College, and he taught at Howard University with the great Toni Morrison during um, the time that she was there. You cannot get past W.E.B. Du Bois. And so I think I was maybe about four, three or four years in when I began to understand that Dr. Du Bois was going to be his, like the muse for the book yeah. and that his words were going to guide us because I first encountered his words when I was in junior high school. I read The Souls of Black Folk and there was something about the way that he was both scholarly yet really bared his soul yeah. in his work that you knew that the progress of African-American people was not simply an academic exercise for him, but that it was, it was something that he had devoted his entire life to. And that sort of devotion was fascinating to me. Um, you know, and and so I, I I thought about that because I've devoted my entire life to writing about Black people. And um, it wasn't until I began to revisit his words that I thought, oh, this is what I'm doing, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and it was, it was, it kind of shook me, you know? Because up until then, I had only thought about myself as a writer and that's a very selfish kind of enterprise. But then I realized, oh, you know, and then I started thinking about other African Americans who had devoted, but we all owe this debt to W.E.B. Du Bois. Do you have a favorite quote that you included in the book that you could read and share with all of us today? I do. I will read. It's from the very nearly the end of the book. And it's from um, the Niagara Movement Address, this was a, a very um, important um, gathering of Black people. And when we call for education, we mean real education. We believe in work. We ourselves are workers. But work is not necessarily education. Education is the development of power and ideal. We want our children trained as intelligent human beings should be, and we will fight for all time against any proposal to educate Black boys and girls simply as servants and underlings or simply for the use of other people. They have a right to know to think, to aspire. That was so beautiful. Thank you for reading his words. Um, I just, for anyone joining us out there, I wanted to remind everyone, you are watching PBS Books. I'm Heather Marie Montilla, and it is my pleasure to be here today with Professor, Dr. Professor Anna Ray Fannin Jeffers. Who I'm is just a professor, no doctor. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> who is the author of The Love Songs of W.E.B. Du Bois. So thank you for joining us. Back to the conversation. So W.E.B. Du Bois wrote a lot about double consciousness. Mm -hmm. um, and that's also a theme in your book. And so mm -hmm. I was wondering for those people out there who maybe aren't familiar with double consciousness, what is it and why did you think it was an important theme to include in your book? Well, one of the things is this is a this is 
undoubtedly a Black book centered in Black communities. But one of the things that Dr. Du Bois uh, was constantly aware of is that once you leave Black communities and you enter white spaces, you are always aware of how white people view you and how you view yourself at the same time. And it's very, it's difficult, it's stressful. You, you never really can relax when you're, when you're not in your own community. It's only when you're in your own community that, you know, you can kind of calm down if people don't like you. It's not about, you know, uh, white supremacy. It's just they don't like you. And so double consciousness is that attitude that you were always aware of what Dr. Du Bois called the two-ness. You're always split in half. And, um, and, it's, and it's, um, it's something that affects every Black person who leaves the Black community, which most of us have to in order to um, become uh, professionally successful, in order to make our money. Um, so that, that's what Dr. Du Bois was talking about. You know, it's interesting because I feel that making Black America in a lot of ways covers, right? There it is uncovering or sharing that story of, of African Americans in the United States and how they were able to prosper in their, in, in their community um, mm -hmm. and how different social organizations, including historically uh, Black colleges and universities and the Divine Nine, how they, mm -hmm. how they started um, in order to, um, to create powerful networks throughout. Mm -hmm. And I would, I would argue, you know, so many of those networks are, are so powerful and, and strong and thriving um, that some of the strongest in our country. So it's really um, why within your book, though, did you construct a fictional, I mean, there's more than a hundred historically black universities. And I believe within your book, it's a, once again, it's a fictional. Uh, yes, not college. Yes. <laughs> uh, so why did you make that choice? I was like, there's more than a hundred. And is it, is it back to your, your thought about like, if you pick something that exists and someone might say, oh, that's, that's not exactly the flower that blooms in March <laughs> there. <laughs> well, one thing is I didn't want to get sued. Ah, yes. I <laughs> because um, all of my classmates at Talladega College and, uh, you know, Talladega, Alabama, I'm still incredibly close to several people that I attended Talladega with. Um, you know, y y they're, they're going to be looking through the book if I say Talladega College and looking for well, who's that based on and who's that based on? <laughs> You can really, you can get in trouble. But I also, there's only, there are only two um, historically black colleges for women. That's mm -hmm. Bennett College in North Carolina and that's Spelman College in Atlanta. And I'm the black sheep of the family. I did not attend Spelman. <laughs> um, Spelman recruited me, but there was a whole backstory right behind there. And really, it just boils down to bad grades. But, um, but, but I wanted a, an, a historically black college that was a co-ed school that had started as an all-women's uh, college. And that there's no college like that. Uh, no historically black college like that. So that's why also why it, it's, it's fictitious. Oh, that's, that's really interesting. Um, at the beginning of your book, you start with a family tree, right? Yes. <laughs> and I, I was curious, first of all, it was a little bit hard for me because I, well, for people who watch the show a lot know I'm like an art person. I'm a visual learner, right? So I was like, where is the real family tree? <laughs> Can I, but- um, Do you have anything to do with that? Well, <laughs> <laughs> um, but why was it in the beginning and not a reference at the end? And, I, and I'm thinking it's because of how it ended and to give a framework. 
Mm -hmm. Um, But, you know, kind of like how that decision, like even when you decided to make that family tree, did you do it before Mm -hmm. or did you fill it out as you wrote? Like, I'm always interested in process. So I had an unofficial family tree, just, you know, when people were born and all of that, because I've been writing about the people that live in Chickasetta for over 25 years. I have short stories about some of the minor characters in the book. And um, so the family tree was just to keep track of who was who, when were they born, and, you know, um, what were the names and, and all of that? Because there are a lot of people to keep, to keep track of. In terms of why it appears in the front and not the back, that was a decision that my um, editor, Aaron Wicks, who um, has since moved on from Harper, but who was, you know, is like my soulmate, right? Mm-hmm. Um, she decided to put it in the front. And I didn't fight that because as a poet, dramatic arc is very important to me. And so I felt like it would break up the sort of poetic moment that when you arrive at the end, even with the archival coda, to have new information in the back was just going to kind of mess up the the aesthetics of the of the book but I felt like it was really important um and then of course the the family tree did change as as I as I wrote there were you know different people where I eliminated them or I added people it was a lot Heather (laughs) it was a lot well, I was even interested when um, Ellie's doing research in a library, right? And then it's almost like the discovery of the papers and the papers and the letters are included in the in the book. Um, and it kind of made me wonder, you know, were you visiting libraries and the archives and finding similar documents um, or they all invented yourself? Like, how did you how did you develop that thought to, to create that, um, you know, the dialogue? Well, I've been in the archives since 1990. So I first visited the archives at um, the Southern Historical Collections at University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. Um, I have copies of letters written by enslaved African Americans. I still have those, you know, copies that were made for me by the archivist. Um What I was trying to communicate is that there's a difference between documents that are sort of static and and real lives. Um, One thing that has been remarked upon is at the very beginning of the book, this is not a spoiler in an 800 something page book, at the very beginning of the book, in the song, you get a man named Dylan Cornell. But in the family tree, he's simply unknown. Mm -hmm. And that is because the spirits of the land know things that humans won't ever know. So there are things that Ailey discovers in the archives, but there are plenty of details that she will never know. There are names of people that she will never know. So I wanted to create this tension between what is known and what is imagined. Um, you know, the, the, there's a theory, critical fabulation or a way of writing from the great scholar Sadia Hartman. She invented that term. And there's so few details in the archives about early African-Americans. And so there's a need to leap into those spaces, those lacuna, and find, you know, imagination, but something that's historically possible. So what I did was I did a lot of research about the, the, you know, what was going on at that time. And then 
I was able to write a story. I mean, there are a few sort of magical realism elements, fantastical elements that people will pick up on. But for the most part, everything in the songs is historically possible, legally possible. And that's why I think some of the more shocking elements in the songs, I won't give spoilers, are very disturbing to some readers because they were not aware that the law did not protect Black children and Black women mm -hmm. and men. So to that point then, um, when we think of some of the difficult ways that characters experience trauma or other situations, mm -hmm. You know, were there things in your research and in your writing, things that you learned? Um, and what did you do for yourself in terms of your own mental health to keep yourself? Mm. Was writing that solution or was it did you have a network that you you mm -hmm. spoke with? How did you stay? You know, how did you stay healthy yourself? As I think some of some of the, the things can be difficult and challenging. Yes. yes. Um, well, a friend of mine jokes that the book took years off my life. <laughs> um, that's both funny and not funny. Um, but um, let me say first, this, this is this is this work is not for the faint of heart, even for those of us who are creative writers. When you go into history, these are real lives. These are these are not just um, characters. Um, even it, though they're fictitious, again, everything that takes place, people being sold away, people being intimately assaulted, you know, all of these sort of things, humiliated, all of that. Th this was part of the power uh, uh, differential uh, and, of white supremacy and uh, chattel slavery. So it was difficult um, because I was also writing The Age of Phyllis at the same time. Wow. Uh, right. I wrote these two books at the same time. They overlapped. Um, the Age of Phyllis, I started in 2003. And then um, Love Songs, I started around 2009, 2010. So there was there was a lot, a um, lot of spirit work. I had a dear friend who was um, in the Yoruba um, religion. And so he would pray for me and he would give me um, rituals to do. Um, that's all I'll say. And then um, uh, I have Christian friends. I'm, I'm Christian. I'm a um, radical feminist, pro-LGBTQ. Uh, Christian and I always say that's like jumbo shrimp. That's like an oxymoron. Um, and so I would have people praying for me and surrounding me with prayer. My atheist friends, they would just send me good thoughts. Um, so I had a community surrounding me in the same way that Ailey has a community surrounding her in the book. Thank you. Um, so the Making Black America documentary by Gates um, focuses on many things, but black joy is one of the, the threads throughout. And I was wondering, I know there are many moments, but can you, without being a spoiler, discuss one moment of black joy within your book that you are excited to share with us? Well, um, originally I was gonna talk about the family reunion, but when I saw the clip and I saw people playing Be It With, um, uh, I, I will, I will connect that. There's a, there's a part, um, where it's a holiday meal and, um, Ailey's cousin Malcolm, uh, wants to play spades because the brothers in his dorm at Howard University have taught him how to play spades and Bale, uh, who's his aunt and Ailey's mother says, you know, spades is for the children you know, bid whist is for grown folks. And so she um, and uh, Malcolm's uh, white mother, who's Belle's best friend in the world, uh, she's taught uh, Diane, her white sister-in-law, how to play bid whist. 
And so then everybody in the family, you know, gets the cards out and whatever. I used to be a big whisk queen. Uh, I used to run a Boston like nobody's business, you know. <laughs> and uh, when I was very young, 17 or 18, and I'd get at the table with like people 20 years older than me and they'd be laughing and then I'd hit those cards on the table. <laughs> um, so I think there are these moments, food ways. Um, are very important to African-Americans. Um, my uncle Alvester was a master barbecue. Mm -hmm. um, and there's always this moment, I, I, I just wrote about this, where you can get a group of black strangers who don't know each other. And someone will start playing before I let go by Frankie Beverly and Maze, and then we will all just start dancing. So there are these moments. And I think that that is the resilience of African-American culture and African-American humanity and, and community, that there are these common things that, that connect us and that allow us to sustain joy and love within our community. Thank you. It's beautiful. Um, so I promised the viewers a little, a little talk about the age of Phyllis. So Phyllis Wheatley, the first female African-American poet uh, who came over on a slave ship at eight um, and landed in, land, did she land in Boston when she came over? She landed in Boston. She was between, we call her Phyllis Wheatley Peters now. She was between seven and eight years old. And um, she landed in Boston. And um, we, we will never know the names of her parents. Um, but one of the things in The Age of Phyllis is I have a whole section about her pre-slavery life because I, I think that's very important. I should also mention, she's not the first black poet, uh, black female poet, that would be uh, Lucy Terry Prince, but she is the first black woman poet to publish a book. So um, yes, she is responsible for me being right here, talking to you. Without Miss Phyllis, there would be no me. There would be no African-American literature. She is the mother of African-American. Well, and even interestingly, she had to go, well, she had to get men's approval first. Yes. <laughs> but she had to actually get her patronage came from England, yes. um, which I always kind of was uh, shocked by. So your book, mm -hmm. Age of Phyllis, is uh, poetry, it's poetry. And can you just for the viewers, share a little bit about it. Because I think for everyone out there, Phyllis Wheatley Peters is this extraordinary individual who many people until recently had no idea, hadn't heard of. Mm -hmm. um, and one of the things that I love about Professor Honoré is that she like basically brought it to so many people's attention mm -hmm. about not only through poetry, which is also so beautiful. So could you just share a little bit about your work? Because I know you worked on it a long time. I did. Um, and, <laughs> and it's, like, it's so extraordinary that you basically, I mean, you won so many incredible awards about it. So you had that published in 2020. 2020. I mean, it's yeah. like, I'm tired. <laughs> I'm tired now because The Age of Phyllis came out in 2020 and then um, in uh, March of 2020 and then Love Songs came out in August of 2021. Wow. Um, I wanted to humanize her. I wanted people to see who this woman was, not simply as a a uh, person that is disembodied from the black community, but firmly tucked into the black community. And I think that I'm the first person that's really, really stressed. Uh, her best friend was black. Her husband was black. Uh, there was a whole community. There are scholars who have sort of talked about, nibbled that on, on the side, 
But what I wanted to do is bring that all together. And it's really a novel in verse. So while The Love Songs of W.B. Du Bois is my first prose novel, I would argue that The Age of Phyllis is my first novel because it, it goes through her entire life and there are these different characters who walk in and who walk out. Um, Dr. Gates's work was incredibly important because uh, he was the first person, I'm embarrassed that I was so ignorant about this, who really talked about the Enlightenment uh, period uh, being the beginning of um, racism uh, as, as, you know, being um, solidified into uh, intellectual production of the West. So Immanuel Kant, David Hume. Uh, so I wanted to show, we always look at her as a symbol of, of how she countered ideas about Black people. But I wanted to show who was the real woman behind this symbol. Um, and I also wanted to connect my own life as a Black poet. You will see in the book that it, in many of the poems, I will reach out of the poem and speak to the reader so the reader understands how even across the centuries, my life uh, is, is a mirror of, of Miss Phyllis's. She had to get white approval to get her book published. I, my whole life as a writer, I've, I've had to have white approval, um, you know, to get my books published. It, it's still like that for every Black creative writer. Well, this has been an incredible conversation. And I, I think just as you, we have to close, but to close on that note, I, I think, you know, our country, we're looking forward to celebrating 250 years as the United States of America. And one of the things that PBS Books is dedicated to is to amplifying those historically untold stories of, of what history actually was, because often history has been written by by white, old white men. <laughs> um, but I feel like the, you know, your work being able to even draw that to today, right? And, and, and is so important and so critical. I am so appreciative that you took the time to be here today for your work, for your insights, for your research. I mean, you work so hard on these works and they are incredible. And I'm so glad we can share it with everyone out there. So Thank you. It's so been a pleasure. Great. It has been so much fun. Um, I just want to remind everyone out there, if you uh, need to go to pbs.org to look at your local time for making Black America through the grapevine, it is Henry Louis Gates' latest documentary. It airs on Tuesdays at 9 p.m. Eastern Standard throughout October. So don't miss it. And if you miss it, you can stream it. So have no worries. Until next time, I'm Heather Marie Montilla. Happy reading.